So, Recreators is an anime where a lot of things happen, and a lot of things get said, and there are a lot of things it's about. But above all, I think it's about the complex relationship between ideas, their creators, their audiences, and the mediums through which those relationships are facilitated. A bunch of fictional characters from anime, manga, video games, and what have you are all suddenly transported to the real world, or rather, an approximation of the real world that were shown within the fictional world. And we are to understand that this is the real world because the fictional characters in the metafictional story tell us that it's real because it supposedly feels more real. Like the food tastes more real. It has multiple layers. Like look at our girl, Medeora the voice of the show, telling us how amazing this boring old hamburger tastes. But that's not really true, is it? Meteora goes on about how much more information there is in the real world, and how the information feeds to her in Silesia's worlds, and so on and so forth, but all of that information isn't actually in the text of Recreators. It's only implied. That exciting, fresh, subversive hamburger that Meteora gets to eat, it's only defined as more tasty. It is only a more tasty burger, because Meteora says it is so within the medium of her new presence in the fictional real world of the fictional anime. And we can presume that if Meteora were to break through the next layer of the multi-layered Matryoshka doll of the worlds into our more real world and then taste our new and exciting real food, she would find something even tastier with even more information packed into it. Where does that information come from, though? Like, words aren't equations. It's not like you need this specific combination of words to invoke this particular material thing, now is it? In our world, things aren't defined by words, at least not to our knowledge. Rather, things just are, and we assign words to those things. Words are only the medium by which we choose to understand these things, and then we use those words to tell of those same things in stories, just as Recreators tells of our hyper-real good food from the real world with words that we understand to mean this imaginary fictional food tastes like our food. So we might find, were we to taste the food, that it would taste like our food, right? Because we would believe that it does and accept it as such. Meteora and the other characters aren't less people when they enter the real world, they're just people, at least within the show's universe, with personalities and real bodies and independent thought and ideas, rather than a script that they follow. Like, take this scene here, where Silesia and the author of her story, Matsubara, argue, and Meteora says that this argument can only take place because Matsubara created a, quote, highly detailed description of Silesia's worldview. So the information about Silesia, what Meteora so matter-of-factly speaks of as if it's a concrete, clear phenomena, made Silesia act like this, like a real person. But that's just a theory, by which they all understand the commonly observed fact that this argument was possible. What the show's rules seem to imply more to be the case is that the words haven't so much to do with it as the idea of Silesia as a person, and the belief that she has a complex worldview. It's not like the addition of one word plus two words make worldview, words don't mean or add up to anything in and of themselves. They're just a medium for conveying ideas. Okay, so why am I saying all of this pretentious nonsense? Two reasons. Firstly, it's because, as you'll know full well if you've seen the show, Recreators regularly trades in exactly this kind of nonsense, to the point that I don't think it would be terribly inaccurate if you described Recreators as a video essay in itself, attached to a battle anime, attached to a banger Sawano score, which obviously isn't for everyone. And I wanted to warn everyone early on 
one, I, I guess. The second reason is because I want to make the point that this is what I think Recreators is about. These fictional characters, these ideas, have to grapple with the experience of their medium of existence changing, and... Wow. What does that even mean? What is that like? To literally be an idea. That's just wild. I want to talk about what I think that means, or at least try. So that's this video. The message transcending the medium, or something. The Philosophy of Recreators, Part 1. I hope you enjoy it. As you can probably guess, when most of these characters, the creations, enter the real world, their first thought is to find the authors responsible for penning their stories, the creators, which doesn't appear to be an especially challenging or difficult task. Once it's accomplished, their goal is, depending on their overall reaction to the revelation that they're fictional, to say hello, rough them up, ask some questions, speak their mind, whatever. In these interactions, we see the first interesting concept the show has on offer, an artist and their art, or rather, their art delivered to them through the medium of a real, actual human being, engaged in dialogue. One of the first major ideas that the show establishes is the notion that this relationship between a creator and their creation is tantamount to that of a parent and their child, and yeah, I've written fiction, I've made OCs. This seems pretty intuitive, doesn't it? Speaking from experience, not to mention just the way artists often talk about their work if you go read interviews or whatever, it's a pretty common habit of writers and artists call their artworks their babies, darlings, or children, or whatever. If you put a lot of time into making this character, it feels natural, especially in our current individualistic capitalist culture, to feel possessive of it, to want to lay a claim to that thing that you made. But at the same time, it's not really a thing you molded deliberately with a clear intent that you can comfortably commodify and call property. Art is random, strange, sporadic accidental. Other factors in the context of its creation might influence what it becomes. It can feel alive in its own weird way, in a way that feels dependent on you, but not wholly of you. So, you being a parent of the child feels like a natural middle ground, I suppose. There might be other artists working with you on it, and maybe you'd say that you all raised this child together, I guess, if you really want to commit to the analogy, which Recreators definitely does a lot. Going back to the arguments between Silesia and Matsubara that I mentioned earlier, <laughs> So, yeah, that, that seems pretty clear-cut then. The next step you'd probably intuit is that if a parent, an author, has control over their child, their art, then all that is necessary to change the reality of their art is to simply change what is written and or drawn on the page. This is the conclusion that the creations leap to, so they try doing that. It does not work. 
So, it turns out that this relationship is a bit more complicated than we might believe at first blush. In short order, it is revealed to us that the reason this effort to amend Salacia's power set did not work is because the viewing public did not witness and accept the changes. In other words, the writer and artist, in this case Matsubara and Marine, do not have unilateral and instant control over every aspect of Salacia's true self. In Instead, the matter of what is true about Salacia falls onto the fandom. Later on, Matsubara publicizes the idea of Salacia's flaming sword, and the desired revision becomes reality. So that makes sense, right? It's not as if a real parent is the sole proprietor of their child. You know, when they turn their child out into the world, that child will grow and change and whatever. They can tell their child to behave a certain way, or tell others how to treat their child, and hope that their preference will be accepted, but if it's decided that what they want is not the best thing for their child, then that won't be the thing that happens. We see this all the time when a writer makes an unpopular choice for their story or characters. The fandom doesn't like it, and depending on the particular story and the flexibility of the canon, they might ignore that change, write fanfiction that ignores that change, or perhaps demand that the writer retracts the change in a future story. Fiction's pretty malleable, so there are all kinds of options here. So yeah, the creations are formed from the collectively accepted ideas of these people who are understood as being like more real people, and you can probably get where I'm going with this. There's this funny interaction later in the anime where these two bros, the creations Kano Yarui and Mirokuji Yuya, are eating lots of that delicious real-world food, and Mirokuji notes that he's, quote, changed since coming to the real world. He presents the theory that removing they, the characters, from their original context has in the absence of their original linearly defined plot objective caused hidden parts of their character descriptions to come into play. Basically, that this new predicament has set off some character development. On one level, yeah, that's what it is, a scientific explanation for why these fictional characters are changing like real people would. That might seem a bit silly. Like the anime is telling us, look, the characters, they are a changin and isn't that obvious? Real people change, so so should characters and stories. Yes, that's exactly right. Characters and stories change, just as real people would, because a character in a story is the idea of a real person, and in the real world, a real person is also the idea of a person, expressed within the medium of a human body. In short, as the idea of a real person leaves the medium of a novel, or a comic book, or scripted show or video game, to inhabit the medium of reality, then there isn't a distinction is there? While I was thinking about the direction of the script and this video, I recalled an idea I'd once caught wind of, an idea I quite liked at the time when I'd heard it. It had been in 2015, I assume since that's when the book came out, when I heard Elizabeth Gilbert, the author of Eat, Pray, Love, and Big Magic, doing a radio interview to promote her book, big magic. She put forth a belief that I really liked that stuck in my mind for a long time. The belief that ideas are literally living beings. I thought this might be useful to bring up, so in preparation for the video I went and found a digital copy of the book, Big Magic, which, it turns out, is not really about this idea that I really liked, at least not totally. Rather, it's a self-help book for creative folks to try and get their groove back. But anyway, here's the passage from the book describing this idea about ideas. I believe that our planet is inhabited not only by animals and plants and bacteria and viruses, but also by ideas. Ideas are a disembodied, energetic life form. They are completely separate from us, but are capable of interacting with us, albeit strangely. Ideas have no material body, but they do have consciousness, and they most certainly have will. Ideas are driven by a single impulse, to be made manifest. 
And the only way an idea can be made manifest in our world is through collaboration with a human partner. It is only through a human's efforts that an idea can be escorted out of the ether and into the realm of the actual. Gilbert then goes on to give some anecdotal evidence for this belief before continuing with the rest of the book, which contains yet more anecdotal memoirs and tidbits of advice. So what do I think of this idea, and what does it have to do with recreators? Well, what I believe Gilbert is referring to is the mysterious form an idea might have before it takes root in the mind of a human, if indeed such a thing exists. I, for my part, see no reason to say that it can't exist. We can't definitively prove it does or doesn't, right? It's definitely a nice idea, at least. But for the purpose of this video, I want to take a slightly different position to Gilbert's. I don't think that ideas are, as she supposes, completely separate from us. I believe, rather, that while ideas may have some modicum of independence from us, they are ultimately sustained by our collective belief in them. An idea lives as long as people believe it, and only dies when it is no longer believed. As long as people believe in an idea, and and are alive to believe it, the idea is functionally immortal. And if all people died, well, ideas would die too. <coughs> or at the very least, they might still be alive, but in the absence of human hosts to make them manifest, they would lack anything to take root in, and thus be functionally dead. Or at least very, very sad. Ideas can get more or less specific as humans develop them, but even the most specific ideas are still ideas. And you can't regulate ideas without drawing an arbitrary line at what is deemed too specific, because, well, like, ideas don't get to be owned by any one person. Legally, sure, I guess, but laws are garbage, and copyright is also, uh... Allow me to direct your attention back to this kick-ass anime about the philosophy of ideas for a moment. Early on in the anime, Medeora seeks out her creator, specifically the creative director behind the video game from which she originated, Evalken of Reminis. She wants to ask them some questions about her and her world, to determine if they really cared for her and her world. But when she visits the game studio to meet them, she is confronted with a literal death of the author. Left with no other option, Medeora buys a copy of the game and stays up all night in search of her answer. The next morning, she returns and says, gladly, that she found the game fun. She is thankful that the game exists, that she exists, thanks to her creator, that they cared so for the world she knew. And most pertinently, she is thankful that... What Meteora is speaking of is the distinction between a piece of art and the medium by which it is delivered. The school of thought I've been not so subtly dancing around this whole damn time. In Patricia Taxon's second, or I guess third, video about why copyright is a lame idea, she explains how art and medium are two different things. In her example, she talks about the movie Inception. So when we talk about Inception, we're not talking about the disc it was played from, or the file we downloaded to watch it, or the reel of film that was played in the theater. We're talking about the one, the only, Inception. It's an idea like any other. When you watch Inception, you take that idea of Inception into your head, and it becomes your Inception. An experience of the film that you witnessed and committed to memory that will be a little different for you than it was for anyone else, like a new drawing in a game of visual telephone. And like any memory, it's not something that anyone else can lay a claim to. When Meteora talks about herself and a Vulcan, and how she will be reborn eternally, she's not talking about the game disc from which a computer would read and play the game. No, rather, she's speaking of the art. That is to say, the idea of herself and her world that will continue to be shared as long as people are still playing the game. This Meteora, here, the one who played a Vulcan, is only one Meteora in the medium of a human being. Thousands more Meteoras remain in the hearts and minds of all those who played a Vulcan. 
and neither Meteora nor her past creator could ever lay any claim to those Meteoras, neither practically nor by rights. And every new Meteora that is born, every new copy of a Vulcan created in the minds of those who play it, is itself a new piece of art. For you see, the value of art lies in its creation, where the value of the medium exists only after completion and distribution, but when the medium has no value, neither does the art. All the value has been brought back to the creation process. So why do we as a society pretend this art is a commodity? It's strange we're so far past the age wherein we traded these effigies. Just see, if you think carefully, you've already decided to come with me. Art is two, only one is sold, the other stews and flies out free. I held my hand right through the door so the value won't be misplaced anymore. But you realize the art and the medium are torn, a world of ideas is about to be born. It's facts, your terrain of stats fall flat in the new world order of fan art and mashups. In the end, we're just stealing it back. We own those guys the limit, so let's get straight. Straight to the moon and back. Black Mary has a map of that. It's Jack. Let's all write fan fiction. It's Jack. You and hey, let's do it. Let's get straight. Straight to the moon and back. The world is built on a DJ's track. It's Jack. Let's all get lost in his shit. It's Jack. You and hey, let's do it. Thank So you're probably wondering what I have to say about this person. And don't you worry, darling, I'll get to her. But first, I want to ask another basic bitch question about the relationship between a creator and their creation. Why did they bother creating these things anyway? In Recreators, this question is left not to the artists, but to their art. Meteora's decision to play her game is in service of answering that question. As she explains, she doesn't want to think her world is an empty one, without meaning and care put into it. In the absence of her creator, that's something she must decide for herself. It's a decision most of us have to make whenever we observe a piece of art, because although the creator creator may not be dead, as Meteoris is, we will likely not be able to ask the creator ourselves, as Meteora would have done had they not died. For us, making that call has little at stake, beyond a judgment of the art's quality and our enjoyment of it, and perhaps the decision to make a video essay speculating about what feelings might have gone into it based on whatever feelings we took out. Hello there, hun. But for Meteora, what she is seeking in making this judgment is a personal affirmation that she was loved, and she goes about this just the way you'd expect a level-headed librarian mage to do. Do the relevant reading, draw the most reasonable conclusions based on it and her observations, and act accordingly. Meanwhile, Alisteria February reacts just the way you'd expect a hot-blooded war-torn knight to. She jumps to conclusions and prepares for battle. The world of Alisteria's story is, well, the sort of world you'd expect to find a hot-blooded war-torn knight in.
So, naturally, Alisteria is none too happy when she discovers that her world is, in this world, regarded as only a fiction created for entertainment. She immediately assumes that anyone who would create such a terrible, death-ridden world must naturally be a reprehensible person, deserving of shame and punishment, and that the right thing to do is demand that they repent for their sins. Okay, well, yeah, I know. I once wrote a similar story where a similar thing happened, except instead of a creation visiting the real world, a reader visited a fictional world and told the protagonist of the story that it was a story. And the protagonist was, reasonably, pissed to hear that people found their plight fun. I was a very bad writer, which was kind of a given since I was like 14, and so that plot never ended up leading into anything or going anywhere at all, because I didn't yet understand the concept of character arcs. Hiroe Rei is a very good writer, however, who definitely understands the concept of character arcs to enough of a degree that he could clearly write a story where the concept of character arcs is a plot device, and make that actually really good. Like, this show is actually really good. Woo woo. What Alistaria doesn't understand is that her story, to those who are most dedicated to it, is not only a story. To be sure, some may see stories like Alice's as just a pithy use of pulp to pass the time, and some creators might make art for insincere reasons, but I think we all know that the vast majority of artists make art with meaning, be that to reevaluate themselves, or their situation, or the wider world around them, to evoke a meaningful emotional response, to teach something of value to others, or to say something that can't be said any other way. I want to bring us to this conversation between Alice and the character of Mamika Kirameki. Psst, I just made a video about Mamika Kira- I mean, Madoka. Kaname and her show. Um, okay, I'm done plugging my other video essays. This is where the theme of Alice's character arc, the thing she comes to learn, is first stated. Alice first says, in response to Mamika's opinion that the so-called world of the gods is a beautiful place, <laughs> And Mamika concedes that. ここはすごく複雑で難しいんだよ。みんなが神様だから英雄なんかじゃ救えない。でもだから様々な色が絡み合って宝石みたいに綺麗なんだ。the substance of these words seems to somewhat pass Alice by, as she is lost in thought, but the truth of Mamika's words confronts her later when Sota, an ordinary boy, intervenes in battle, refusing to stand aside, lest Alice kill Medeora. In explaining why, Sota tells of how Alice's audience has witnessed her story, seen her hardships, and how they are all rooting for her. Not because they enjoy seeing her people die, her world be destroyed, but because they care deeply about her world, and because they want to see her save it. Because... <laughs> And also, yeah. Around the time Recreators came out, Persona 5 had also just come out, and I had, uh, I took about 200 hours of time to sink into that game. I'd like to do a whole video about Persona 5 sometime, examining it all in detail, along with Persona 5 Royal, when that's out in the US. It's, uh, it's a thing I have a complex relationship with, the Persona series. Persona 5, if you don't know, is an urban 
fantasy JRPG about teenagers battling demons in another world to save their world from bad people who are bad. A lot of the game's various episodic scenarios are pretty transparently based on real-life scandals that actually happened in Japan, and the game's director has very openly said in interviews that, yeah, this is political, I mean to say, in this game that we live in a society. And I really liked this game, in part because it was about how we live in a society, and because it evoked in me a hope that one day that society could get better, and also because it was just fun. Here's just a little bit of a spoiler-free Persona 5 analysis tangent for you. If you'd like to skip this bit, I'll just put a timestamp, uh, here. That seems right. When you first boot up the game, there's this really cool little menu screen. We have all the main heroes of the game, the Phantom Thieves, all lounging about in a contemporary subway station. The subway is an important thing in this game, both for the theme and the plot, and we have this cat on top of a subway clock, you see. It is a large cat with a large head. The cat's name is Morgana. He is an important character. So, when you select New Game, Morgana slaps the clock with his paw, and if you look closely, you notice, oh, what's this? You won't really be able to tell this in the video, but the clock of the game menu is synced up to the clock time of your PlayStation console. This choice may very well have been just a fun quirk that the designers thought would look neat, but I'd like to think it's a very deliberate choice that plays into the game's intent of saying that we live in a society. Okay, so, minor spoiler. I guess. <laughs> when you actually start a new game, you are first asked to accept a disclaimer saying that the game is a work of fiction, not to be taken seriously that it has no bearing on the real-world reality you are living in. However, when you get to the end of the game, you learn that the voice declaring this disclaimer was that of the game's ultimate villain and final boss, and Morgana's role in the plot is, well, as a guide to the player to lead them away from the dangerous path of complicity that this villain wants the hero to go down. Morgana and this clock are telling you that the villain is lying. The time on the clock is your time. The society in the game is our society. We share the same time, the same society. The story's time and our time are the same time. Do you get it? <sighs> and when I thought of this, long after having first beaten the game, just staring at the menu for a little while, that stuck with me. I mean, I already knew the game's message, but like, that idea, it's just neat, you know? That you could convey such an idea with such a simple system in the context of a game like this. I just love that. I'm sorry, tangent over. I just really like this particular detail in the game and wanted to share. The world is bad in Recreators, just as our world is bad, which is natural given it's set in contemporary Tokyo, and one only needs to have Google, or play Persona 5 I guess, to be aware of the ways in which it's bad over there. I've been there for a week, but well, my anecdotes can't count for much. Point taken, I hope. The world of Recreators, the real world, is meant to be a proxy for our own very real world and stories can help to make our very real, very bad world at least feel a little less worse. And for those who are in the worlds of those stories, well, Alisteria, confronted with Soda's emotional response to her story, is led to question the conclusions she has jumped to about her author's intent, and so she seeks out the truth. Just as Meteora did, she seeks to affirm that she was loved but with more, uh, threatening. Alice's creator, Takarada Naoya, confirms that his authorial intent was indeed to evoke hope and promote Alice's values of strength and justice, a justification which Alice is ultimately satisfied with. He also says, <laughs> Alice 
So, now is a good time to mention that Recreators talks a lot about fate. If you've never written a story, be it a fictional story, or a novel, or essay, or whatever, you might not know quite how it feels to write one. As I brought up before, it often feels as if the story has a life of its own. It's less so much like you're executing steps in a master plan, and more like you're nudging the characters in the world you imagined into a position somewhat close to where you'd like it to go. Conscious choices are certainly made along the way, and sometimes it will be more deliberate and careful, but just as often, writing, or creating art in general really, comes as naturally as speaking, breathing, walking. You hardly think about the minutiae of your creation. You pick a direction, and you just do, until such a time as you need to change course. Or as Takatara puts it, you make ends meet. If you accept the recap episode as canon, which I do, Meteora absolutely knows that the show is itself a story in our world. She brings it up early on in the show to Silesia and Soda as being highly likely, and multiple times throughout the series she flatly states that fate has led the chain of events to this point. For the creators, it is natural, intuitive, that to create a genuine world, it must lead a genuine path. And for the creations who live within those worlds, they come to realize that their story world cannot be so easily changed as they may initially want to imagine. And for us? Well, maybe there is a writer out there, scripting our world, but we can't know. We can only assume that we are free to write our own stories, just as those in the quote-unquote real world of recreators ostensibly are. Their fate, and our fate, and our freedom to freestyle fate, may very well be just as genuine, or just as inauthentic, as the Homburgers.